We're going to continue our study on the rapture. Last time we spoke about the book of Revelation, on how there was two groups, one group in Revelation 7 and another group in Revelation 4. And we spoke about how um, Revelation 4 talks about people that were, uh, sorry, Revelation 7 talks about people that came out of Great Tribulation. So the Great Tribulation had started and they came out from there and how their song was totally different to the ones in uh, Revelation uh, 4 and 5. And so uh, we saw how the one in Revelation 5 uh, is the church and how they were singing that God had redeemed them with, with his blood and out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And so they were redeemed out of... Uh, uh, f from the Great Tribulation um, uh, before it started, out of it. And the, the group number two were redeemed that came out, uh, were saved that came out of the Great Tribulation. So let's open in a word of prayer and we'll continue our study. Dear Lord, thank you, Father, for this evening. We pray, Father, that you bless your word to our hearts and minds this evening. Father, and we pray for your knowledge and wisdom from above. And Father, help us, Lord, to focus uh, without any distractions. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about this evening uh, pictures, a little bit of a fun study, um, just some pictures of the blessed hope. So we'll start at uh, Hebrews 11. You open, your, open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. And so remember, we've got to keep in mind everything that we've already um studied because there'll be a lot of questions on why and how how did we get to there a lot of it we can't go through it again but we're going to look at some pictures some people call them shadows some people call them prefigures just like the lamb on the doorpost is a picture of the lord jesus christ the lamb uh, the passover in the old testament that's a type a shadow a prefigure of the lord jesus christ how they put the the, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. The rapture also has that. And the rapture, although it doesn't teach it in the Old Testament, but we can see figures, again, or shadows or pre, uh, uh, prefiguring uh, that God has that plan. God always had the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. And so that's why we're going through the study of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. And so, um, but the rapture doesn't teach in particular, specifically the, uh, in the Old Testament. It's not taught in the Old Testament because it pertains to the New Testament church. And there was no church yet back then. And remember, we've proven over and over again that the church is not Israel. It's not a part two of Israel. And it's not a better version of Israel. But there are, but there are types and shadows and uh, prefigures of the rapture. So a bit of a fun study um, tonight. Uh, hundreds of Old Testament scriptures foretell New Testament events, and the rapture is one of them. Uh, like we said, Passover for the blood of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Uh, this is part of our great confidence in the Bible, because so many prophecies were fulfilled, and so many prophecies are to be fulfilled. They haven't been fulfilled yet. And so this is uh, our confidence that we have in the Bible, and it's, it's important to study it. And so we're trying our hardest to keep it as simple as possible. can get confusing at times. Some prophecies are obvious, like the Ethiopian reading, uh, the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8, how he was reading out of Isaiah and how that, uh, the, book, uh, the Isaiah 53 was telling of Jesus Christ and in detail how he was going to die on the cross for us. That's a prophecy, uh, prophecy that's very obvious. And Peter many times referred back to Psalm 16 and, and, and so on. Um, uh, there's other prophecies where future truths are presented. So they haven't been presented yet. Uh, they will be in the future. And that's what, that's what we're looking at. Um, other prophecies are more obscure. They're a bit of a stretch. I find them a bit of a stretch sometimes. But that's because there's so much to learn in this Bible. And so cross-referencing and proving them is a bit more difficult than others. But we've chosen some of the simpler ones uh, tonight just to go through. Um, 
remember, so the body of Christ is a separate entity to the nation of Israel, totally separate. And this is, this is what we base our pre-rapture um, study on. The church was a matter uh, kept hidden from men until Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Romans 16, 23, uh, 25. So there are mysteries that the Bible talks about that we've gone through before. Uh, the mystery uh, of the body of Christ told beforehand. God knew what He would do. He would establish a church and save people would form the body of Christ. He always knew that, but He didn't make that known until Christ arose. And Paul speaks of that many times. Ephesians 3, 9, you don't have to turn there. Keep your Bible open to Hebrews 11. I'll get there in a minute. Uh, Ephesians 3, 9 tells us this mystery was a truth established from the beginning of the world. So it's not unusual. And it's, it's very important for studying prophecies. Many people think it's a stretch to go through some of the things we'll go through tonight. But we're trying to prove that there are many topics that prove that are pictures back in the Old Testament that are fulfilled now. Um, so that mystery was kept hidden in God. And it concerned Jesus Christ, the church, eternally united in a loving union like a husband and wife. Ephesians 5 that we went through a few weeks ago on a Sunday. The mystery, which is now revealed, took the Jews and Gentiles who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and united them as one in Christ through the new birth. And that's why the Bible says, it doesn't matter where you, what your background is. We can have Jew, Gentile, Africa, whatever, where you're from, China, Russia. Uh, doesn't matter where you're from. In the new birth, we're all united. Uh, it wasn't like that in the Old, Old Testament. And so that's, that's, a great mystery. that's the great mystery uh, told of. Back in the Old Testament, so when, now if we're talking about resurrections, and resurrection is just simply, oh, we know the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but there were r people that were raised from the dead, which is a picture of what was, what, what was to come. Elijah raised the boy from the dead. In Ezekiel 37, the nation of Israel, that's a great picture of their future resurrection to live in the promised land. Specifically spelled out in Ezekiel 37. The oldest book of the Bible, uh, Job 19.25 says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. It's a great song on the album of Messiah. And Job said this in Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's a picture of in his flesh seeing God standing before him. But yet all the accounts that resurrected, human accounts that resurrected from being dead and eventually uh, from being dead, all the ones that resurrected and were ro that rose from the dead, eventually died again. Lazarus, he, was, he rose from the dead. God, uh, Jesus Christ called him forth. But eventually he died again uh, later on. The widow's son, Jairus' daughter, except one. That's Jesus Christ. And he went up and he stayed up there. And another example that we'll share soon. Um, so the hope of Job and all the Old Testament of Israel says nothing about bodies being glorified. And we went through that in one of the first lessons of the rapture, that our bodies will be glorified to go and meet Him. Um, <clears throat> the mystery of the body of Christ includes translation, our physical bodies being translated, transformed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, from a vile body to a glorified body. Uh, and we went through that too. Um, when you combine the truths of what we've already spoke about, 1 Thessalonians 4, Philippians 3, Ephesians 5, 1 John 3, 1 Corinthians 15, the great chapter of the resurrection, Revelation 2, 3 and 4, when you combine all these passages together um, uh, that we have studied, it's evident that one separate special group of people, that's us, will be glorified by our bridegroom to spend eternity in His presence. You're a privileged lot of people and so am I. The church is very privileged to have this uh, special calling. Um, 
God has revealed that the future of the Hebrews in John 9 and the future of the Gentiles in John, uh, sorry, John, Daniel. God has revealed that the future of the Hebrews in Daniel 9 and the future of the Gentiles are in Daniel 2 are spelled out in the Old Testament. But the future of the church is unfolded in the pages of the New Testament epistles. We must be careful not to force the body of Christ into the warnings and prophecies and promises, sorry, into the warnings and promises given to the Hebrews. That's what this study relies heavily upon. We're not forcing the body of Christ into the warnings and promises that were given to the Hebrew people, the Jews. In saying all that, there are at least four clear pictures of the rapture in the Bible and around six which come across less cl with less clarity. Uh, Enoch, very little written about him. We find him in Hebrews 11 and in other passages, but very little is written about him. But what is written about him is very meaningful, very important. Um, he is found in the roll call of faith, Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11 uh, verse 5 says, By faith, Enoch <coughs> was translated that he should not see death. He didn't see death at all. And was not found because God has, had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That was his testimony. So if we called Enoch up now to share his testimony, it would be less than two seconds. He pleased God. That's it. Praise God for that. Guess what happened? Because he pleased God. He didn't see death. He went straight up to be with God. This man did not die. He went directly from the earth to heaven. That's a, that's a resurrection. That's another meaning of a rapture. That's another meaning of going from earth to heaven. In Genesis 5.24, you don't have to turn there. It says, and Enoch walked, uh, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Very simple. He walked with God, praise God. And that's, that's the New Testament. Christians are told to walk with the Lord. That's what we always preaching on. You're going to have a, a blessed time, and you're going to have a more abundant life and a happy life if you're walking with the Lord. And that's all it says. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. That's not take him in death, although in other parts of the Bible, when it says they, uh, they, they, they got taken away, sometimes it means death. But because we have Hebrews 11, he wasn't taken in death because Hebrews 11 says he didn't die. He was taken up. He was just taken straight up. That's a great picture of the rapture that's going to happen to us. If Enoch walked with God, then God also walked with Enoch. They had a fellowship and they had a relationship. This is the importance of the Christian. So they had a personal relationship. And this is totally different to the relationship that God had with the nations. It doesn't say he had this personal relationship with the nations. And it doesn't say that they walked together. This is an individual person walking closely with God. When you compare... Enoch to Noah, Noah came after Enoch. And here's a great picture not only of the rapture, this is a great picture of what happened to Noah. Noah was preserved, we're not going to go through the whole story, many of you know that, uh, what happened with Noah. But Noah was preserved by God through a time of wrath and ruin. Noah was preserved through the great, known as the great flood. He got preserved by God through that. He didn't escape it. He went through it. He didn't avoid it. He was kept alive during that great outpouring of judgment on the ones that rejected God. That's what happened. And no one, they were all laughing at Noah. No one believed in what Noah was saying. They stayed on the earth and they drowned in the flood. So if Noah goes through the flood, through the judgment of the world on the earth and comes out of it alive... Who is that? What's that picture? That's a picture of God graciously taking a chosen, preserved remnant of the human race through a time of trouble. Noah represents going through a time of great tribulation. And Enoch represents someone that had nothing to do with that great tribulation. 
That's a, a fun picture to, to see in, in the Bible. And before that first wave of water came, before the ark set sail, before the first drop of rain ever fell, Enoch was gone. Enoch disappeared. He vanished from off the face of the earth, gone to be with the Lord. If Noah is a type of those preserved through the judgment, he would represent those who survived the great tri tribulation. In Luke, let's turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Speaking of storms, we'll get to the storm in a minute. But Luke chapter 12... Remember, Luke, we've shared before, Luke is written to show the man, Christ Jesus, the Savior of sinners. And the focus is on the spiritual kingdom of God. We're going to cross-reference from Luke to Matthew. And Matthew presents Jesus Christ as King. And that focuses more on the kingdom of heaven. We haven't gone through this. We'll, we'll spend another Wednesday uh, talking about this. But that, that focuses mostly on the physical kingdom of heaven. And it represents Jesus as king. So we'll look at Luke first. Luke chapter 12, uh, verse uh, 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet. And will come forth and serve them. That's a picture of the bridegroom making the bride ready. If you're here on that Sunday when we'll talk about husbands and wives and the bride to the bridegroom, uh, let me finish, but keep that in mind. Blessed are those whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Great picture. And then verse 38 says, And if he shall come in the second watch, or in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. You notice how third watch, and uh, second watch and third watch, in, in the, the soldiers, they used to have time, they used to have um, uh, uh, shift work. It was like shift work. Every three hours, they were called to come and watch for three hours. Then they'd have a break and another, another soldier would come and watch. And, and they'd have turns doing that. And so notice how it's pretty vague on speaking about this picture of the bridegroom coming for the bride. It says, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch, that's a six hour, roughly a six hours uh, uh, gap, and find them so blessed are those servants. Let's continue. Verse 39, And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have su suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when, he, when ye think not. Now all of a sudden the Bible has shifted. The Bible has made an example of a thief. You never know when a thief is coming. And it made that example. So yes, it said the second or the third watch, but now it's shifted to as a thief. And then it ends with the Son of Man coming at an hour when ye know not. Very vague time, but a certainty of Son of Man coming. That's, you can be 100% for that. That's a certainty that the Son of Man is coming. Are you ready? Jesus Christ is coming. Are you ready to meet Him? Or are you going to hide yourself like in Revelation where they ran, hid themselves and they wanted the mountains and rocks to fall on them? We'll get, to, we'll get that in the future. Are you ready to meet your Maker? Are you ready to meet the one that died on the cross for you? The coming is certain, but right here in this passage, the time is very vague. We don't know the time. And that lines up exactly with what we've been reading about the rapture in the New Testament um, uh, epistles. Paul was speaking as if it was going to happen when he was writing the epistles. Still hasn't happened. And it's still yet to happen and no one knows the date, no matter how much YouTube you watch. 
That's why we are more blessed being group one in Revelation 4 than the second group. They had the signs of the different colored horses and the signs in, in, in Revelation 6. And so we are asked to keep watch like it's going to happen in five minutes or like it's going to happen in five years, 10 years, 20 years. No one knows. And that's, that lines up with Paul. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. <clears throat> we'll quickly go through that and then we'll, we'll go. It's interesting. We've been here not long ago. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. This is where Jesus calms the storm. But we didn't look at this angle. This is what I mean by going through verses and passages multiple times over. Because if you're not thinking rapture, you're not going to see it. If you're not thinking prophecy, we're not going to see it. And so that Sunday morning when I shared this, uh, the storm, we weren't talking about prophecies or rapture. We are just talking about how wonderful it was to follow Jesus and have faith in Him and how uh, Paul, uh, Peter stepped out of the ship. But now we'll look at this angle, 14.22. It, uh, the Bible says there, Matthew... Um, ah, sorry. Yeah, I'm in the wrong place. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. It, the Bible says there, And straightway Jesus constrained His disciples to get into a ship and to go before Him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Notice, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Jesus goes up to the mountain. The ship is on water level. That's the lowest level you can get on earth. When you're at water level, that's, you can't get lower than that. So every house is built above water level, even though some are very close. If they were built under water level, there'd be a problem. And so he went up, the ship is at water level, verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, that's very specific. That's around 3 a.m., 3 a.m. to um, within three hours. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So this is just before uh, sunrise. So right in the mi middle of the night. So that's specific. The Bible's telling us intentionally that he came in the fourth watch of the night when his disciples were in trouble. Again, a picture. A picture of tribulation. Not the great tribulation, but they are in trouble. And now he's coming on a specific time. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea they were troubled saying it is a spirit and they cried out for fear notice they didn't cry out for him they didn't think oh let's cry out for jesus remember we called him master and lord and and we called him all those great titles now they forgot everything they had their eyes on the storm and they didn't cry out for him he just comes for them and the king, here he comes to calm the storm. He's not coming for the bridegroom. He's coming for his disciples that are in trouble. And they cry out for fear, which reminds me of Revelation um, uh, chapter 6. Let's go there quickly. Revelation chapter 6. So they're crying out for fear. Nothing in mind to call out for Jesus to come and help them in the storm. All they can think of is crying out for fear. And then we get here to Revelation 6, verse 15. Remember, pictures only, figures, types. We're talking about types of um, rapture and the Great Tribulation. So Revelation chapter 6, all the horses come out, white, second seal. We're up to the sixth seal. And here in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, and the kings of the earth, it says, and the great men and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, that would count everyone that's still on the earth, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains 
and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That reminds me, that, that, was a, uh, that reminds me of the picture of how they cried out for fear, seeing the storm. These people have seen that the tribulation have started, peace on earth, on earth is taken, a false, uh, false prophet riding a white horse. Um, we'll get into this later in, in verse 2, who gets a crown. And as we know, um, that false prophet uh, is always counterfeiting what Jesus Christ would do. And they've seen all these horses come out. Death and hell has come out uh, on a pale horse. And um, all the peace on earth has taken. And these guys are crying out for fear, just like those disciples in the ship. Not asking for the lamb, but they're asking to be hid from the lamb, the one that sits on the, on the throne. All right, we've got to move. Uh, Malachi. Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, just before Matthew. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And verse 16. Right on the last page for mine, just before the New Testament starts. <clears throat> so let's look at Malachi, a prophet, a Jewish prophet for the Hebrews, and a picture of the rapture and the great tribulation here, type, picture, prefigure. Notice he's talking to the nation of Israel, and it starts off, him talking about the nation of Israel, but he's talking about other people. And take notice of the word they. In Let's start at 15. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that walk, work with wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Interesting. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And the book, uh, sorry, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Uh, yeah, we'll go 17. So notice he's talking about other people and we'll, we'll slice this up in a minute. 17. And they shall be mine saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, interesting again, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. That's very interesting. Now, as, as I say this, look at the verses again from verse 16. Let's note a few points here. The people are mentioned and have been spared from something. They have been spared from something. That's what it says there. And also, they are in a place where the Lord judges them according to recorded accounts. It says there, a book of remembrance was written. So, verse 16, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon His name. In 17, you can see the people mentioned have been spared from something and then they are in a place where the Lord judges them according to recorded accounts. And also, the time of this judgment is before the second coming. We'll see that in chapter 4. Uh, the, the second coming. And the reward given is not life. It's interesting, the Lord given, it's not eternal life, it's not life. The reward that's given is jewels. Jewels are given to them as a reward. Um, that's in verse 17. Um, and it's according to their conduct. The next, the next note that we want to note, the action is rewarded. Uh, the actions that are rewarded with these jewels are odd. It's only actions because they are speaking about God. See how it says one to another, then they that feared God, the Lord spake of often one to another. 
and the Lord hearkened and heard it. So their actions are rewarded uh, because they're speaking about God. It's noted that they feared God and they were thinking of God and that thought upon His name. They were thinking of God. That remind you of someone? That's not what you would think that would earn someone rewards just by speaking of God, fearing God and thinking about God. The people are not servants, which is the title for Jews, but the example is that they're sons. And the title, that's the title for born again believers of Christ's church. The example there is is clearly sons. And so then after this sparing and after this judging and after this rewarding of these people, verse 18, it says, Then shall ye return, these are the same people, and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. And we'll go on to chapter 4 in a minute. But it says, Then shall ye return. So they were somewhere and they have been taken to another place and now they are going back to the original place that they were at. It says, then that, then shall you return. And then what are they going to do? Discern between righteous wickedness and who's serving and who's not serving. Who's not serving God and who's serving God. Once these sons of God who have been spared and have been rewarded for showing their love to God, they return to the place where they came. And they are given places of discernment. That's like a place of authority to carry out their rule and reign over righteousness, wickedness, and who is serving or not serving God. This is a perfect picture, if you haven't caught on yet. This is a perfect picture of the church, titled as sons and titled as they're getting rewards. So that's the judgment seat of Christ. Once we are raptured, these people are getting rewards, jewels, it says. That's the crowns in the New Testament church, in the New Testament epistles. That's the crowns that have been handed over to the church just because they praised him, we spoke of him, and we worshipped him, and we loved him, and they, re- they get raptured. They, get the, they go to the judgment seat of Christ. They get their rewards according to their conduct on the earth. That's the church. And then they are sent back to earth to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. This matches nothing else in Scripture. And this is what I was saying that is part of prophecy. Part of prophecy is to match where these passages stick out and match them uh, to the prophecy foretold in the New Testament about the New Testament church. So Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Uh, we've seen that before. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that uh, and that sorry, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Everything's going to be burnt up in this day. The return of these sons is marked by a fiery destruction of the Lord's enemies by the Lord Himself. And so this distinction from chapter 3 to chapter 4 is marked by this destruction. Then we have... Uh, notice, notice here that the prophet starts talking about we rather than they. So we, this, this is where it ends, where it's talking about they, the church, and now it's coming back to Israel, we. And Malachi is, a, a like I said, Hebrew prophet, and his message is delivered to Hebrew people concerning their sins and their future and their judgment and what's going to happen to them. So he switches now in verse 2 to the word you. So he switches to you, no longer talking about other people. No longer are they. And that's the nation of Israel he's talking to. So verse 2, 
but unto you, see, that's his, his prophecy is now directed back to the nation of Israel, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. We'll, we'll explain this in a minute. Verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes unto the, under the soles of your feet in the day that I, sh I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. That's not the church. This is a, this is a war. This is a description as a, uh, of a war. He's going to tread. He's gonna, it says there in verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked. We're not, we're not going to do that. We're not treading down any wicked. And they're not going to be ashes under the soles of our feet. And we're certainly not going to be in an oven, uh, burnt to uh, seeing people burnt to stubble. We're obviously not going to be here. And so, uh, especially when he starts sell it, saying, you and ye. Now he's directing it straight at the nation of Israel. And he's saying in verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet. In this day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. So it's a prophecy of when he's going to do all this. Verse 4, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. He's telling them to remember the law of Moses, which I commanded unto you in Herob, <coughs> unto him, sorry, which I commanded unto him in Herob for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, verse 5, behold, I will send you Elijah, that's not us, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's what we've spoken about, uh, never a day seen like this before. Punishment coming onto the earth. Worst day ever, we titled that, that um, lesson. And so in verse 6, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and uh, smite the earth with a curse. So back to verse 2, the rising of the sun is commonly known as the second coming of, of Jesus Christ. The healing in his wings <clears throat> is the healing of the nation and is, well understood, is a well understood promise of the kingdom promises. Calves in a stall, that's a picture of calves in their stall. In their, dwelling, in their dwelling place, safely and are well fed. That's another kingdom promise. That's tribulation. That's a kingdom promise of the nation of Israel, not the church. The other thing we see is their enemies have been consumed and only the ashes are left. They're called, another one is that they're called back to Moses. They're saying, remember ye the law of Moses. They're called back to Moses and to the law, and to the commandments, and to Elijah, and to their holy mountain. All this points to the many millennial truths regarding Israel, clearly detailed in lessons before, and there's still many to cover. So when you look carefully, while you read your Bible, while you study for prophecies, you have to notice who the Lord, or who the prophet, or who Paul is talking to. Is he mentioning a they? Or is he saying, verse 2, but unto you. Verse 2, and ye shall go forth. Verse 3, and ye shall tread down the wicked. Verse 4, remember ye the law of Moses. I will send you Elijah. He's obviously talking about the nation of Israel. And all this, without a doubt, is the province of Israel. It's the field of of Israel, it's Israel's department, it's not ours. So it's clear when we finish the chapter uh, and start chapter 4, uh, finish that chapter 4, the first section is a they, someone outside of the nation of Israel, that's the church, and uh, they are going to get rewarded and they are mentioned as sons and they are not citizens of the nation of Israel. And that language, when you pick up on that language, uh, you can't allow uh, those people to be included in the promises or the judgments or whatever the nation of, uh, or anything got to do with the nation of Israel. And then 
you see a third group here. So we see a they, and God loves those people. And that's, I've already said, that's the picture of the church uh, being raptured and going to the judgment seat of Christ and getting rewards and jewels and crowns. Uh, and then we see how he speaks to the nation of Israel in chapter 4 as you and ye. And then there's a third group here. Who are they treading on? Who are they getting? Uh, who are the wicked? All the proud, all that do wickedly shall burn them up. They're the ones that are going to get burned up. They're the rejecters of God. That's who the judgment is coming upon. Neither, uh, and it says also, neither, uh, neither leave them no root or branch. So nothing is going to be left of these people. Only the ashes. So this passage is filled with types and pictures. It tells of the nation of Israel. It tells of the second group. Um, it also told the nation of Israel that they have a Messiah who heals them. That's the, 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 um, the, healing, the healing in his wings. And he blesses them and he turns their hearts back to the prophets, Moses and Elijah. That's the Jews that are, that are going to go through it and survive, come out alive. It tells of the second group. That's the church taken from earth to be rewarded. Who calls them, he calls them sons, who then returns to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And that third group are the enemies of God who are destroyed. So it's a blessing to have this blessed hope. And it's a blessing to have, to know that these, uh, to grow your confidence that these prophecies were fulfilled and they continue to be fulfilled. Don't, don't forget, if it's true from the Old Testament, to the New Testament. It's true from the New Testament onwards and the book of Revelation. So praise God we're on the winning side. Um, my next point is a lengthy one, so we'll leave that for next time. But um, hope that was a blessing to you. Remember, the blessed hope of the church is a comfort. It gives comfort to the believers, um, which Jesus Christ purchased with his own blood. Um, the blessed hope holds... Uh, the never-failing thrill of the Lord Jesus Christ's imminent return, any time. And so that's, that's part of why we serve wholeheartedly. That's part of why we're ready, Luke, uh, the, the passage we looked in, Luke, being ready always. Um, and the, it's funny how it makes the example of a thief, not knowing when that thief comes, and neither do you know the hour when Jesus Christ comes. The divine cure for it's, uh, the blessed hope is a divine cure for heart trouble. John 14, we went through that when we studied the book of John. Let not your heart be troubled. Um, did he go? He did, he did go and he promised if he goes, he's coming back and he's coming back for the church. It's the prescription for permanent joy. That blessed hope, that's why it's a hope. And that's what I was sharing with the gentleman on, on the, the phone too, that not only a good life is important, but you need to have a blessed hope to look forward to. What's the use in having a good life and you have you not know what's going to happen after you step into eternity? And so that's part of the, that, that was my most, the biggest trouble I had before I got saved. And so um, pray for that gentleman. His name is, he's, uh, like I told you, uh, Hayden. And so when you have that prescription for joy, uh, like in John 16 says, verse 22, And ye know therefore um, uh, have, sorry, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. That's Jesus Christ saying, He knows you have sorrow now. Of course you do. You're a saved person in this world having to deal with all this wickedness around you. And He says, And ye know therefore, uh, uh, therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. That's a promise. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. That's also a blessed hope of eternal security, not only a blessed hope of Him returning to take us. Our blessed hope is an incentive to serve Him. He's coming again to take us to heaven. Why not serve Him every day of our lives? Uh, every time we get a chance, of course, He is worthy. That promise is not unbreakable. And so it's an incentive to serve Him and to remember Him in the breaking of bread. 
That's one thing we miss out um, uh, when we break bread. But 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, part of what we're celebrating, not only the body and the blood, it's also Him coming again. It says there in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For as often as ye eat this bread and drip, drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till He come. That's the blessed hope. That's 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, And so that's, that's part of the, the um, breaking of the bread and the remembering the blood. And so we, we have nothing to complain about. It also moves us to earnest, patient service, service for the Lord Jesus Christ when you know He's coming. And that's that great chapter that we'll go through um, in future lessons, 1 Corinthians 15. Don't forget that one. That's a great chapter of the resurrection uh, and the gospel. Starts off with the gospel, verse 1 to 11. Holy Spirit tells of the gospel of the death, burial and resurrection according to the scriptures. And then it shows straight after that and the witnesses of the resurrection. When you witness, make sure you're putting in the resurrection. The death, the burial and resurrection. In Acts, a lot of people like to just preach hell. Yeah? In Acts, it was very, very limited hell. Uh, most of the time, they're preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's very important. And the witnesses of that resurrection and how they witness that. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 to 34. The Holy Spirit and uh, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, defends the resurrection to unbelievers and doubters and, and drives that in. Verse 35 to 50, uh, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, explains how the resurrection and the body will work. Uh, that's how much detail we've got. Uh, we have a chapter in Scripture that details how it's going to work, how we're going to go from this vile body to the glorified body, from corruption to incorruption. Um, and, and that's not all. We get to be with our Lord after all that happens. And not only, and before that happens, we get to be with Him right now and walk with Him as Enoch walked with Him. What a blessing. Um, and then the, the chapter finishes from 51 to 57. The Holy Spirit tells us of the victory over death because of His resurrection. A promise, an unchangeable promise that we're going to have a victory over death through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. All that and the Holy Spirit through Paul, what does he finish with? He finishes in verse 58 of the great chapter, chapter of the resurrection. After explaining all of that, guess what he ends with? Go serve the Lord and be unmovable. That's what he, that's what he ends with. In verse 58 it says, Therefore, my beloved brother, brethren, after he explains the rapture, the glorified body, all of that, he's saying, that's nothing. Even though you got that promise, it's not nothing. It's just not nothing. It's n nothing to be concerned about now. It's only to give you confidence to go, verse 58, therefore, the whole chapter, 58 verses of explaining the resurrection, and he says this, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What's he want you to do? He wants you to go out there and work, not sit at home and brag about how you're going to get re resurrected. The most important part of that whole chapter is that you be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the whole point. Doing the work of the Lord. That's what God wants you to do that's the whole point of the death burial res resurrection is that you go out and tell people about it and abound in the work of the lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain your labor is not for nothing the result is straight up glorified bodies to be with your lord and savior but get busy now and serve him with all your might always abounding in the work of the lord let's close in a word of prayer